Okay. Okay, uh, can you all hear me in internet, in YouTube? Okay, uh, can, I, can I start? All right. So, uh, welcome back. For the ones that survived the two earlier days, I hope you're having a good time. I hope you're not sleeping in the planetarium uh, with this low light, with an invitation for sleeping, at least for me. <laughs> anyway, um, so today we continue our, our class. If you want to make questions, please move forward. In the last few days, I was hoping that you have a lot of questions. As a matter of fact, you didn't reach me or Luciana, so please, you are here to help. I'm aware that you should uh, make a project by the end, so tomorrow I will bring you some ideas and um, show you what I would expect uh, in, the, in the final projects. So please, reach me, reach Luciana, uh, if you have uh, questions. If you would like to say something, have to if you would like to give some feedback even uh, about uh, how the classes are going on, <laughs> okay? So, uh, last thing that we spoke yesterday was about pre-processing and how to deal with data, okay? F especially for deep learning. This is, is more, or le more or less a common practice between uh, machine learning and deep learning fields. Um, but this is especially important for, for deep learning. Uh, even though deep learning can uh, process uh, relatively more raw data than a traditional machine learning uh, method. Anyway, so today we start talking about a lot of CNNs. I show you the principle of what a CNN is uh, and what it can do. It was proposed uh, in the context of um, identifying images but it can do way more than that. We will talk uh, a little bit about this today, show some applications we worked on in astronomy. Uh, but mainly you are not going to hear about the specific uh, layer of convolution. You will hear about um, different neural networks that are uh, on the market, let's say. So let's skip a little bit uh, before when um the the CNN hype started, okay? So this uh, came back around um, 20, uh, 1998. So uh, most of you were not um, studying anything yet. I was particularly learning how to maybe, I don't know what this uh, epoch, what I was learning, maybe writing. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is uh, Lenet is is uh, uh I would like to introduce you this was the the neural network that was uh proposed to solve the MNIST uh problem which is the one I showed you in one of the examples so you have five by five filters uh step one uh and two by two filters with step two okay there is a common sequence and you start seeing the pattern that I mentioned before 
the bottleneck, okay? So the thing starts huge, you start uh, making things smaller and smaller in terms of um, the, the data structure that comes in, um, not in the, in, the, in the third dimension, but at, uh, in the level, in the size of the matrix. And then you start f uh, finding fully connected layers, which are the dense layers that I showed you before. Uh, and this converts until you reach your end, your goal, which is your output layer, okay? So that is it. It solved the problem. It was a relatively um, shallow new network compared to what we have nowadays, okay? So later on, we have AlexNet, <laughs> which was deeper than Lenet. Uh, so the, the neural network started getting deeper and deeper. So now it's 2012, uh, so you pass many, many years, and the neural networks are way more deeper. Uh, we started having uh, competitions around the world uh, who could, um, what the neural network design would be the most um, efficient to identify images, okay? Uh, and so we have AlexNet now with five convolutional neural networks uh, layers uh, with a batch of 128. This is big for our current standards and it first introduced the ReLU function, which is more efficient, uh, computationally speaking, than the traditional uh, sigmoid or logistic ones, okay? So you see that the structure is evolving, more parameters. As we go for more parameters, we are more prone to overfits. That's what happens in most of the cases, okay? Uh, then we start getting the V GG, which is uh, a traditional uh, convolutional neural network that was coming up to the limits uh, without overfitting, okay? Trying to build something uh, with this structure uh, at that time was, uh, was huge. And uh, the neural network field was not that interesting that time because the innovations were, oh, let's make it deeper. Let's go deep and deep and, and enhancing the performance. There was some small um, small innovations, but still it's, it's the same structure that you've seen uh, before, okay? No big innovations. And as we go deeper and deeper, more prone to overfit, okay? Then we start seeing something uh, more like uh, uh, a big change, which are these uh, Google Nets. Uh, and later on, what we, we was known by the inception uh, neural networks, okay? So the inception layers are a propose of a non-linear layer. As you can see now, what happens, let me point, use the pointer here. Uh, first, in, in, the, in the previous scenarios that I showed you, what you have was a sequential, okay? So everything goes through the, the same path. The data flow is unique, okay? Uh, now you don't see the same thing. You see these small uh, boxes here, and each one represents different operations. So the data flow was split, it, uh, was split it over the neural network, okay? So that's the idea. So no linearity anymore, no sequential neural networks, all right? So that's uh, the big innovation. So what, um, what, uh, what Google Net and Inception provide us is uh, with this powerful idea is avoid some uh, conversion issues that we were facing before, we were uh, around the limits and provide us to make uh, uh, deeper neural networks without overfitting or to have similar performance of uh, big neural networks like uh, VGG, like I showed you before, uh, uh, making uh, the same kind of performance or even beating them with much less parameters. So now the rule is, uh, can we do the same with less parameter in a more clever way? That's what uh, was in the, in the focus then at that time. 
And then we got the ResNet. ResNet, uh, back into 2015, introduced the idea of uh, simply shortcuts without having this complicated path in the Google Net, in uh, Inception Neural Networks. Uh, what we find is uh, these simple and, el and elegant shortcuts. Okay, they increased the ability of the neural, neural network to converge in trains. They allowed us to make uh, uh, deeper and deeper neural networks. So now we were talking about to around 152 layers, uh, millions and millions of parameters. I don't have in on the top of my head the number of parameters, but this is becoming very huge. Uh, and in and with these shortcuts, instead of the the complicated path of inception that uh, split the data flow in uh, several different operations, this simplistic shortcut allowed uh, avoid the vanishing uh, most in many cases the vanishing gradient problem. Okay, so uh, the optimization increases. Uh, as you may understand uh, quickly by your uh, discussion of backpropagation, if the gradient vanishes, uh, we are in trouble. We can no longer opti optimize the neural network because the step to, to optimize the neural network is to use and change the, the, the weights in the, uh, in the direction of the gradient. Okay? So we can reach a lower error. So that's the main idea. So you see the schemes getting more and more um, operations, but now with this elegant, uh, uh, elegant uh, shortcuts. This uh, ResNet is, is a common standard nowadays. If you're starting uh, a problem, it's reasonable, it's common to start with a ResNet if you're using a problem that involves uh, image and structured data, okay? Uh, that's not always for uh, this kind of neural networks are not always only defined for images. You can use in regular tabular data if you want, if you can, you, uh, you can use in whatever you want. You just have to take care about um, how to build them in a way that it fits for your problem, okay? But it was proposed in the, in the context of, um, of images, okay? If I'm talking too, too uh, quietly, please let me know. I can raise my voice. All right. Then we come to the efficient nets. I mean, at this point, there was a full zoologic zoo of uh, neural networks. Anyone was trying to make, um, to make uh, their own named uh, architecture. As you can see in this plot on your left, there is many, many versions of many things. Uh, and with some of them with some, some sort of weird names, as you can see there, uh, and many other proposals, okay? So many people were proposing stuff, creating benchmarks, and uh, efficient nets is the one that I, I pick as an a, a interesting example, because the innovation at this point was the following. Let's use a simple neural network with a, a good enough performance, okay? So on your left, you see the ImageNet top one accuracy. The ImageNet top one accuracy is the accuracy in the most well-defined category of image of the ImageNet data set. ImageNet data set is a standard data set in computer science uh, to make uh, image, image in benchmarks, okay? So you have several classes, um, and, and, and with them, you can make a, your, uh, you compute whatever ne neural network you want uh, and make classifications and use it as a benchmark. So you are looking on your left, the accuracy, the top 1% accuracy in the, the, uh, in the ImageNet database. So we use it uh, uh, so we can compare different neural networks. And as you can see, the number of parameters grows uh, fast in many neural networks, okay? We are reaching 160 million parameters, uh, which is way less than ChatGPT, for instance. Uh, ChatGPT uses a very different technique uh, that's called attention, uh, that if I have enough time, I'll, I'll be able to talk for you, uh, to you a little bit uh, tomorrow. 
Anyway, uh, so the innovation in efe efficient net was taking care about the increase of the flops or the floating um, floating point operations. So and the number of parameters by by construction in uh, in that case. So the idea was, can I build a neural network with lower parameters and still efficient? Okay. Uh, so, so they start with a reasonable, high efficient neural network, similar to uh, to what we call mobile uh, networks. Why is this important? Well, from that point, uh, in many situations, people were starting thinking about uh, uh, computational efficiency, uh, not only getting deeper and deeper, because uh, one of the reasons is simply the fact that. Um Identifying images, classifications, is a very well-solved problem in deep learning if you have enough data, okay? So now we turn our, our attention to uh, having it uh, precision, uh, uh, efficiency, computational efficiency, okay? Uh, and this starts to matter as people were starting to put uh, deep neural networks in smaller, um, smaller uh, electronics. Okay, uh, what we call in Portuguese uh, uh, embarcados. Uh, I don't know if you say this in Spanish, but uh, in when you put uh, Internet of Things, if you if you want to put a, a neural network inside uh, your car, inside um, uh, some electronic that you have at your home. Okay, so now uh, this. Um, this kind of, um, of electronics doesn't ha uh, allow you to have big clusters. So you, have to you need to have efficient neural networks. Uh, so they start with the mobile neural network, uh, which is similar to the B0. As you can see on your left, the, the first red point is called B0 in efficient net. This is the mobile, uh, it's similar to the mobile neural network. The mobile neural network, as the name already tells you, was proposed in an idea or you can put inside your cell phones, okay? Uh, so, and they start a recipe on how to uh, increase this neural network with performance while controlling the number of, of, of floating point operations, okay? So that's the idea. And they reach this very high performance uh, efficient net that increases in parameters so it start it stopped at around 60 million parameters with uh, accuracy way better than the the ResNet 152 okay which is one of the biggest ResNets all right so as you can see and and way uh, 100 uh, more efficient than the Amoeba net which has around 150 million parameters and uh, with lower efficiency or accuracy, okay? So that was the idea. And now we have this very, very deep neural networks with a high uh, computational efficiency to solve uh, problems of uh, pattern recognition, to solve problems of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, tabular data if needed be. And uh, what can we do, okay, uh, with them? What can you do to take advantage of uh, all these well-established fields? Well, you don't have to need from scratch. You start from scratch. That's the thing. So you can. Uh, this uh, this slide shows you two uh, two standard ways of doing stuff in deep learning. One is then is training from scratch, and the next one is transfer learning. So the idea from training from scratch is you you start your weights in your neural network. Well, with random numbers, or with a clever initiation, but uh, uh, they are not trained. Okay, so s you can customize whatever you want in this neural network simply because the the weights are not defined. Okay, uh, you you easily realize when you talk about uh, uh, shared GPT and uh, large language models that have uh, billions of parameters that can have billions of parameters. That's not the very smartest way of doing things, right? Simply because, uh, well, it takes a long time, so it requires a lot of data if you learn everything from scratch. Instead of doing this, 
uh, you can take one of the, the neural networks that I just showed you, uh, like um, uh, ResNet and uh, efficient nets and so on, and you can start them with the weights that were previously trained in a big data set, like just like uh, what I just mentioned with ImageNet. Okay, so ImageNet is a big image da uh, data set, so you can start your neural network already with this, uh, with this training. This is a process we call transfer learning. There is a, uh, this concept is broad, it can be better defined, we will talk uh, more in the next slides, but the idea is to take advantage of previous training. So if you were supposed to make a lar large language model like ChatGPT with billion parameters, imagine how much data you would need, okay? Uh, the, the, these big companies usually often doesn't, doesn't tell you uh, what they use for training, uh, these uh, this, this big uh, language models like ChatGPT and BART and so on. Uh, but we can imagine that they use, uh, for instance, the whole Wikipedia, okay? So that's not an easy thing to storage in our servers. Uh, it's something that is continually changing, uh, is dynamic. Um, so it's, I think I made myself clear uh, in the advantage of doing uh, transfer learning, right? You don't have to do this all the time. What will you gain? Well, you gain convergence for sure, it will, it will converge way faster, uh, but you might be thinking about, well, I'm trying to find if I'm looking to an early type galaxy or a late type galaxy. Uh, what would a neural network train it for uh, detecting uh, cats or birds will ever be helpful to me? Well, the idea is, remember the first steps of the, the neural network it's trying to find patterns. So the patterns can be shared among several different problems. Let's say you are trying to, uh, to, to find a um, uh, galaxy, okay, uh, if the galaxy is elliptical. If you use a neural network that was previously trained uh, with data set that includes tires that are uh, circular shapes, they are likely to be filters to detect circular and ellipsoid shapes. So you can see that you are in advantage of starting from that uh, neural network. Um, we usually get confused because there is a, um, there is a frontier between uh, the patterns, the, the, the small patterns, and the semantic or the meaning we give to the patterns. So in terms of semantics, uh, we try, try to find a galaxy, but the, the lower level patterns are just ellipsoids, okay? So uh, the neural network doesn't care about the semantic of what they're looking for. They only cares about what the pattern is, and this is shareable knowledge between different neural networks, okay? So the question for transfer learning is, should I freeze or should I fine-tune my neural network? How does this work? Well, you have a big model. This is just a, a very, simple, um, very simple example, okay? You can make a froze, you, you can froze the neural network during the training process, okay? Uh, or part of it, which means I'm not going to update this uh, part of the neural network, okay? So that would be the idea. Uh, so while you're doing this, uh, you, you are using the exactly same, uh, same weights uh, that was previously defined for the other training sets. Uh, there are layers uh, uh, that you need to fine tune, which are uh, the last layers. And I, I think I already made the case for that, right? The initial layers are trying to get more generic patterns, and the last layers are connected to your decision-making process, okay? So you can fine-tune them. You can only allow, the in your new training uh, with transfer learning, you can, only, uh, you can allow only the last layers to be updated. 
what are the, the advantages and disadvantages of doing this? Okay? So frozen, not changing anything during the training. Fine tuning, you can update in your, your new training. All right? So uh, if you freeze more and more uh, uh, parameters, this means that the free parameters are, are, are getting uh, smaller. Right? So you have uh, less free parameters. In this case, uh, what you gain is you probably need less examples. Remember, with lots of parameters, you need large data sets. If you need chat GPT, you probably are going to need way more things than just the Wikipedia. Okay, you have to train with lots of things. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the first uh, in the first class. We were just uh, I was trying to point it out some difference between uh, humans and uh, and the way machines work, right? And one of uh, one of the ways they they do work differently is exactly this: the number of examples that a human needs to find a pattern is uh, way lower than uh, what uh, what the machine needs, right? And I can see this I, I can say this by heart. I have two kids that learn way faster than any neural network a uh, simple image pattern, okay? Well, coming back to the freeze and fine tuning, uh, that's an option that you, you, you can d decide. Uh, is a common option to froze the convolutional layers, uh, but if you think you have enough data, you can let them free as long as you want, okay? Uh, so there's a trend here that you, have you need to decide. All right, so let's go to astronomy. One of the examples I'm talking most here, because it's a recent example, is related to a paper uh, led by me in 2021 and another one led by also by me in 2023. Uh, this is the early and late type, and it's a common issue in extragalactic astrophysics, okay? There's also great works from, uh, from Galaxy Zoo team and, and, and Mike uh, doing the same kind of work in the legacy survey, uh, doing this kind of analysis with, uh, with um, deep learning, okay? So uh, are the galaxies late type or early type, or are galaxies spiral or elliptical? I like to share this image because, uh, well, not you, I believe, because you are uh, most likely astronomers, but many people, uh, have no idea on how difficult this can be, okay? Or even some astronomers that doesn't work uh, directly to data, uh, they only work with catalogs, uh, they, they sh sometimes they, they don't, don't have a clue on how hard this can be. So we are looking in, uh, into S plus data right now uh, with some examples that I think it's uh, particularly hard to, f to, to distinguish at the first, okay? There is saturation, so by looking at this image, you, you, I hope that you have the same feeling as I have, that uh, there, there's a lot of worse work that has to be done in terms of standardization and, um, and all the hints I gave you uh, yesterday on how to deal with data, okay? So uh, one of the key examples here is one of the, in the top row in the last column, which has a big star over it. This is the kind of stuff that n that's usually not easy, uh, not going to be easily decided by your network because uh, the dominant signal is a signal that you need to ignore, okay? So that might be an issue. Um, they can compromise the, the classification process. So just so you have an idea. Other stuff, they are very, very close to the uh, limit resolution, okay? And the good thing to tell you is uh, this might not be a com completely issue for the neural networks, as we experienced in the case of, um, of, uh, of strong lensing, uh, where, where I work with the producing strong lensing finders. Uh, we, we saw that the human eye uh, was not as good as uh, defining strong lensing in simulations, okay? I'm talking in simulations because in simulations you can actually uh, construct by first principles 
uh, what the strong landing is, right? So we don't have uncertainty on that field. Um, so you can, uh, so the idea is the, the machines uh, beat humans in this kind of patterns, all right? So that's the good news about it. All right, so a uh, few experiments on this, so, so you can see uh, the, the some early results that we have uh, on this field. It's easy for, uh, it's hard for us sometimes, but the machines can do pretty good if you uh, know how to teach them. So uh, this is just an example of what we got in real life, okay? So don't be scared if your uh, training uh, doesn't look very well, just look at mine, <laughs> okay? And your model accuracy. Uh, there is one important thing to say about astronomy is uh, astronomers like to invent classes, right? They like to put things into boxes, like planets. What are planets? What's a dwarf planet? Uh, what's the boundaries over them? Uh, what's um, a spiral galaxy and the boundaries of um, uh, between spiral uh, elliptical galaxies uh, and, and lenticular galaxies? So these artificial created boundaries gives us uh, intrinsic ambiguity in astronomy. Uh, and uh, well, deep learning doesn't like uh, these ambiguities. <laughs> so uh, these things can happen, okay? Uh, because the actual boundaries of your program may not be so well defined, all right? So you can see the ROC curves that I showed you before. The error bars are related to the, the to the to the the cross validation. So you see the median and the standard deviation over the cross validation. Okay. Uh, so you see some examples on your left. You see some examples on, on your right. It all depends on how you produce uh, and if you are training from scratch on your left or you're making transfer learning on your uh, right. You see that the result increases a lot. And specifically, the, the, the uncertainty uh, between different uh, folds or different runs becomes way, way smaller. So you can see the advantages of making this uh, transfer learning, right? It's also included balancing uh, that I mentioned yesterday, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about um, not classifying images because I already talked a lot about this. And let's think about other physical parameters. And this comes to the idea on how to choose your loss. I don't know if you realize it, uh, but the mean square error loss is the default loss for the regression, regression problems, okay? As is in the classification, we use the binary uh, cross entropy or the categorical cross entropy, okay? In the case of, uh, of, um, of regression, uh, the standard is usually the mean square error. And if you remember your, your, um, your, your statistics uh, class, you know that this is closely related to, um, to the maximum likelihood estimation. Okay. So this is, there is uh, an assumption uh, underlying uh, what you're doing of Gaussianity uh, on that, okay? Which is not a, uh, it shouldn't be a, a big deal at first, uh, but just so you know that we are not, just to make myself clear, deep learning is not equivalent uh, ipsis literis uh, in terms of uh, what the maximum likelihood is. I'm just making an analogy and show you that it's closely related on on that um, on that method, okay. So uh, in terms of analogy, so the mean square error loss is uh, is a sort of uh, in in tune <laughs> with uh, what will be a choice for a maximum likelihood estimation, okay. Uh, let's move on. So you, but that's not the only choice, okay. Uh, but uh, it works pretty well um, most of the times. Uh, 
but you can also try, depending on your regression problem, the log of it, or the root mean squared log error. Okay, uh, that's particularly useful if your target variable uh, they they spread along a very big range uh, and uh, with a very uh, the sampling not uh, with big areas uh, where your 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 image sample is is uh, doesn't have any data. Okay. So you have a very wide open problems in terms of range of what you're trying to make a regression. Uh, you could test, there's a, a good environment to test the root mean squared log error, okay? So that's one of the idea. So you see uh, a test that we did with the mean square uh, loss and the, and the log on the top and your bottom. They look similar, mm. however, they um uh, but you, you, you should uh, look on the, um, how they converge a little bit faster in the log terms. There is also the absolute square error. So not the mean square error, but the absolute mean square error. Okay? What this is appropriate for? Well, if your problem has a lot of outliers and you need to keep them, remember that I mentioned that you should throw away outliers, so if you need to keep them, a possible solution for your problem is trying the, the absolute square error, okay? So I put, uh, in case of outliers, do matter in your analysis, all right? So that's uh, the other thing. Moving on, um, what are metrics for? When, when we define the neural networks in the examples I showed you, uh, we had um, uh, the loss, but also the metric, okay? Um, the metrics uh, that we use when we define it is just to have a hint if your training is working well, okay? Is, I, it is not to use it uh, mind, uh, not using the training process like the loss, okay? So there's some example of uh, usual uh, metrics like binary accuracy, categorical accuracy for classification, and the regression metrics. Again, you see the mean square error. So when you define your neural network, you define a loss, which is the, the topic we just uh, said. Uh, but also, when you when you define it, uh, you do a training evaluation. You usually uh, uh, put uh, the the metric variable in your model dot fit, uh, and you define a metric to evaluate uh, to see if it's uh, the training is working well. It's not used for the training itself. It's just a, a, a check that you do. Okay. Uh, one of the things that happens, let's say, 9 to the 10 students that arrive in my department is, oh my God, the metric doesn't make any sense. So the person shows the right loss, the loss plot is working as expected, everything seems working, however, the, the metrics uh, uh, to make the validation, they doesn't make any sense. And this is uh, usually related uh, when someone used the wrong metric for um, evaluation your results, your training results. Uh, as simple as this. For, for instance, you have a regression problem and someone used binary accuracy. It doesn't make sense. Okay? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll move now to an example on the what can you do in terms of um, of uh, regression uh, in an image, okay? To that end, I will introduce the problem of modeling strong lensing, uh, okay? This is an example I did, is is in archive. You can check there if you want to. Uh, so the idea is, it was built upon um, a famous nature paper so I produce my my example uh, after after it. So uh, the idea, the question is, can we make a reliable modeling 
uh, not only um, image classification or, uh, or just um, regression uh, with deep learning uh, on, on strong lensing or astrophysical images. So that's the question I raise uh, with the, the example I put in archive, okay? Uh, and how do you do this? Uh, I would like to draw your attention to one thing right now. Uh, we, are, we are changing completely the view over the problem here. First, we are talking about, oh, is this a strong lensing? Is this is not the strong lensing? Is this an early type galaxy? This is not a early type galaxy. Okay, so that uh, was the thing. <coughs> uh, now I'm asking a way more delicate question, which is, uh, can we make inverse inference, inverse modeling? So I can I look to an image and I can make the deep learning give me the parameters that created that image, that were used to, to build that image. So physical parameters that are not directable measures, like the galaxy shape, okay? Uh, so that's what the idea. For this uh, purpose, we produce a lens population, strong lens population, mimicking DES, Dark Energy, uh, energy Survey conditions. Um, we cut in signal to noise, to see uh, resolved images. Uh, we simulate a lot. We simulate uh, with an algorithm called LensPop, 80,600 galaxy scale uh, uh, lens system. Uh, and we also use another set of uh, open simulations uh, when we, we could reuse a strong lensing uh, challenge simulations to build the same thing. So um, the modeling we use is called the singular isothermal ellipsoids. This model, you can see the, the, um, the density, which is dominated by dark matter. This rate directly related to an observable uh, called velocity dispersion that's observable uh, in spectroscopy, okay? Uh, and um, and uh, the Einstein uh, radius which is a measure on how effective is the lensing, uh, the lensing uh, system, okay? This is also related to uh, the velocity dispersion, sigma v. Uh, it also depends upon the cosmological distance the between the source and the lens and the lens. I'm not sure how aware you are of, of strong lensing, so the idea of strong lensing is you have a galaxy in the front and you have a galaxy in the back, which is uh, the source, and the mass over the lens, which is described by the left equation in the singular isothermal ellipsoid, the mass distribution, uh, is uh, deflects the light from the galaxy uh, on the back, okay? So that's the main idea. And uh, we propose this inception model, which is the one, one of the models I showed you. Uh, well, that's not exactly one of the models I showed you. I showed you Google Nets model. So we build a neural network that uses the same kind of blocks that you use uh, in the Google Nets, so inception blocks, okay? So then you input the, the image, you make a, conv a convolution, you make a normalization, you, you add an activation function, and then you pull, uh, then conv again, until you get to the inception non-linear blocks that are omitted here, uh, and later on you make your decision, okay? So the idea was to try to obtain in those simulations these two quantities, the Einstein radius, um, which is, uh, is a measure of how strong the lensing effect I is uh, or, or how curved are the, 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 the lensed images and also the velocity dispersion, okay? So this is the one by one plot. You can see in our x axis the, um, the, the real values on the simulation and uh, you can see on the y axis the predicted one, 
and uh, one, two, and three sigma uh, errors. Okay, I will talk later on about this, uh, how these error bars are done. So we also estimate the redshift. As you can see, the lens, uh, the redshift, and the source redshift. Uh, in uh, one of the examples, we're going to show you how to uh, exactly get photometric redshifts uh, over galaxy catalogs. That was a little bit different in this example because I'm using images. Okay, and uh, the next question we have on our minds is: uh, Could we maybe try to see some final signs over it, not only estimate parameters? So can we, for instance, oh, let's be um, audacious. Can we um, can we uh, check if general relativity works? Uh, well, very audacious, right? So let's uh, put this in perspective using the same model. The Einstein uh, radius uh, can be written in terms of um, as you can see, uh, 4 times pi time uh, the velocity, this version, observe it, uh, and the summing parenthesis 1 plus gamma uh, divided by 2 is uh, a modification you do in the modified gravity, okay? So the modified gravity theories, when you diverge from general relativity, they have uh, this parameterization, and the gamma um, uh, is equal to 1 if general relativity, if GR is corrected or not. Okay? So that uh, would be uh, the idea. Okay? Uh, and um, and uh, this parameter is called the leap parameter. Uh, it's related on the diversion of the prediction of general relativity and the modified theories of relativity. So in principle, we can use it. Uh, the same uh, kind of algorithms we were using uh, to estimate, at least for the sake of those simulations, to check it, okay? So I'll not tell you the results uh, right now, okay? I will, I will let this suspense for tomorrow, so just to understand how we can frame, um, frame the, the neural networks uh, in terms of um, uh, of, of getting uh, final science over it, right? You can make inverse modeling. I showed you that we can. Uh, tomorrow, I'll show a plot uh, with this result, if we diverge it or not on the sleep parameter. Uh, last but not least, I mentioned about you about errors, okay? And tomorrow, we'll talk a little further about errors, okay? I'd like to first introduce you the idea of errors in deep learning. Well, deep learning, uh, well, neural nets are known to be universal approximation for functions. I mentioned that in the first class, okay? Uh, so, um, how does that work? Well, it's a function, uh, a, a function approximation. So, in principle, I could uh, disturb this function um, a little bit, okay? to see what was the closest uh, function representing my data uh, over the, the uh, that is close enough to the best fit. Okay, that will be the idea. So the neural net, the training neural network represents a sort of a best fit uh, of a, uh, for a function uh, trying to map the input data to your uh, parameter summation, okay? But how certain is this function? So the, fun the function is defined by two things, by the architecture, but mostly by the uh, open, the free parameters that are being optimized, okay? So the idea in, in deriving errors, one of the most strong ideas, the one that people still use nowadays uh, in, the, in, the, in this uh, novel papers of uh, galaxy morphology is to make up uh, disturbance in the in the neural network trains uh, weights, okay. But after the training, remember that I mentioned a technique called uh, dropout. When you drop weights out uh, during your training process, so you make the neural network smarter, smarter and not uh, overfit, okay. So 
uh, you can you can actually apply a dropout in a training neural network. Okay, so you can define uh, disturbance and you can optimize this disturbance that you do over the weights. And every time you run the neural network in the same input, let's say, uh, it will drop some weights out. Okay, uh, or re reinitiate them. Okay. And this means that for a single data, a single image, let's say, you can get many different and uh, predictions. And um, this is I it works like a sample that we call Monte Carlo dropout. Okay? Uh, with this Monte Carlo dropout, you can derive a PDF. Okay? That's the idea. So uh, it's a strong concept here. You are um, disturbing neural network weights in a clever way that I didn't uh, enter into much detail. Uh, and uh, with that in mind, you can sample uh, uh, a sort of PDF. Okay, This is not a PDF uh, with the same meaning of, of what we used to see in statistics, right? These PDFs actually encapsulate how robust the neural network is uh, in terms of that inputs, how much certainty the neural network have in terms of your input data. We are usually presented to uh, error theory, talking about um, uh, systematic and random uh, uncertainties. And these uncertainties are closely related uh, to how you, you obtain your data. Now we are talking about the uncertainty into your modeling, which was your deep learning modeling. Okay? Because if the, the neural network is very certain about the, the prediction, um, uh, if I slightly disturb it, the outcome will be very close. That's the main idea. Okay? This kind of uncertainty is known as, um, uh, as epistemic uncertainty, okay? Uh, so that's one of the important trends that, uh, that we can define. And uh, a clever way to define the way on the producing this, um, this dropout mask, or how to disturb in your network, is known as concrete dropout, okay? So I'll... I'll Today I'll stop. I'll stop uh, here, so we can have um, plenty of time for the for the for the the lab, because now the lab is going to get more dense and dense. Okay, and uh, feel free to reach me to get questions, and if you like uh, to make any comments, uh, be my guest. Okay, well, thank you. I can't hear you. Can you speak a little bit louder? Okay. Um, He's asking about the difference between the PDF we derived from deep learning and the um, regular uh, statistic PDF, right? Well, the idea is uh, you are trying to measure how certain your model is, okay? Is your model uh, understanding the data? Uh, when we talk about error theory, we are usually talking about error that comes from the data itself the process of, of taking the data. So taking the data has some signal to noise. Let's say you are measuring uh, magnitudes over a, a galaxy catalog, okay? So you measure uh, the magnitude and the magnitude error. The magnitude error is a measurement of signal to noise on your data, okay? Here, this is not the kind of error we are talking about. We are talking about error in the modeling process. is a kind of systematic error. 
that is related to the way your uh, neural network understands and if it's understand robustly or not the data is trying to uh, uh, to model does this make sense okay any other questions any other questions If not, uh, Luciana will take over today and present you the, the Google Colab with some examples. No, no. Hi, my name is Luciana. I explanation uh, about uh, today collab. The first collab is about image classification, uh, galaxy in images, and galaxy dies the call using CNN from Astro NN package. The first cell you import Astro NN and you you execute you can execute uh, uh, run in the cells for import the Astro NN. You load data and the, the images is classification in 10 uh, class. You can import the uh, packages, packages, the uh, Python. You in the next cell, you you show uh, some images class zero class. Someone class. Um, you you click in other cells. You prepare data to train and split the data set. And you train in predict model using package package uh, CNN. Galaxy Dice. And you you can uh, run the cell, the next cell, and uh, view uh, rock results per class.
and you test your uh, propose is making a uh, rock per class and you uh, can check the results. The second column uh, is about photometric redshift uh, with a random forest. Random forest is uh, decision tree uh, from a scikit learning package. The first cell. Uh, you can uh, import package Python. After you define a function for open fixed catalog, we download load data table and remove uh, some elements known this table fits you you show you print uh, the table catalog Or you can convert data uh, table da data uh, from data frame pandas is improve uh, the pr process. You print. You show plots in the of mag magnitude uh, mag U G <laughs> sorry and you you show the spec plot In the next cell, you prep you make prep preprocessing and sli is split data set, and you can normalize by like uh, scikit learning package. Finally, you training and predict using random forests. The next cell, you, you can define it, uh, metrics uh, with sigma and means and in plots fu functions. And, and finally, it is show redshift plot uh, compa uh, when compare a true and predict redshift. You can test uh, making 
histogram é, plot from data normalized. normalized. E, and you can é, can think is necessary other pre-process. Bueno, cualquier consulta, Luciana queda a disposición. Si quieren trabajar un rato, cuatro y media, tenemos como siempre el café. Así que...